All right. Uh, good morning or afternoon. I don't know where everybody's logging in from today, um, but just welcome to our current uh, our webinar. It's great to it'll be great to speak on this uh, great topic with our folks and our, our team that's being led uh, by Molly Ryan, uh, who is at Global Blood Therapeutics. I've known Ryan, um, excuse me, Molly for years, and she's been a great mentor and she's been an asset in help in this healthcare space that I started to learn to navigate it. So I'm sure she's going to be great in navigating all of us through today's conversation. So with that, I will turn it over to, well, one thing before I get it to you, Molly, there are just sorry to announce what I have to make. One, the National Annual Summit on Health Disparities is the first and um, the last weekend and last Monday and Tuesday of April. So we hope to see you there. And two, if you or anyone you know is uh, under 40 and work in the healthcare space and makes a good contribution to the healthcare space, please nominate them for a 40 under 40 award. Um, with that, I turn it over to Molly Ryan. In from. As Brendan mentioned, my name is Molly Ryan. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs at Policy at Global Blood Therapeutics. It is wonderful for you all to join us for an important conversation uh, about sickle cell disease and look forward to uh, your questions. Please continue to put them in the chat. Please continue to put them in the comments. We're going to be monitoring those. Um, I would be remiss if I really did not thank the National Minority Quality Forum for the opportunity to put this panel together, this webinar together. Uh, I have known Gary since I first cut my teeth in health policy um, a couple of decades ago and just really thank him and his team for all the incredible work that they are doing on health disparities and shining the light on uh, the inequities that there are in healthcare, especially for minority communities. Um, I am joined today by two amazing uh, healthcare professionals I'm going to start off with Dr. Betty Pace, who is a professor of pediatrics. Uh, I hope you were all able to see um, their backgrounds as far as the uh, when the webinar was sent out. Uh, Dr. Pace is also a Francis J. Tedesco Distinguished Chair of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Augusta University. We were just joking earlier, if we were to go through both their bios, we might spend the entire time just talking about the incredible uh, uh, wealth of information that they have, and also just their resumes and their bios just speak for themselves. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Bari Annamariam. She is a professor of medicine at the University of Connecticut at School of Medicine. Uh, welcome to the both of you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us during this webinar. If we could have the first um, slide up, uh, that would be great. Uh, we've prepared uh, a presentation uh, that really helps you better understand uh, how we're thinking about sickle cell disease and the framework to really improve care from two different types of setting, pediatric to adult care. And again, we're joined by two amazing experts that are uh, in the weeds. They are on the ground, really working to deliver care for our patients. Um, I'm going to turn it over uh, on the next slide to Bari to help us better understand and what is sickle cell disease for those that are unfamiliar with this uh, chronic condition and rare disease? And then we will talk a little bit more as we progress through the program, uh, this centers and the framework that we have developed as a community to really advance um, new federal funding uh, to really bridge that gap of care. I'll turn it over to Bari. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Molly. It's also a pleasure to be here with Dr. Pace who has been my mentor for many, many years. Uh, so again, thank you to the National Minor Minority Quality Forum for having us here today. And I'll take the next slide, please. So some of you may be very familiar with sickle cell disease, but some of you may not. Uh, so for those of you who aren't, uh, please go back one slide. Uh, sickle cell disease is an inherited condition. It's not something you catch. It's not something you, you get later in life, but it's an inherited uh, blood disorder uh, that actually causes a change to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a molecule that's inside all of our red blood cells. And its sole function is to deliver oxygen to the tissues and the organs throughout the body as the red blood cells circulates throughout our blood vessels. Um, in someone with sickle cell disease, their red blood cells are different because the hemoglobin within it is different. And the red blood cells become rigid and stiff 
and they can change shape into a crescent shape, which is also called a sickled shape. And this occurs after the red blood cells hemoglobin releases oxygen to the tissues and organs. And when the red blood cell changes shape and sickles, uh, this can cause many problems. First of all, it can cause anemia, which is a low volume of blood. And that's because the red blood cells, after being stiffened and changed in shape, can be destroyed. Uh, this also causes blockages within the small blood vessels to blood flow. And when you have an impedance of blood flow, uh, you have an impedance of delivery of oxygen throughout the body. And when you have low oxygen delivery throughout the body, this can cause diminished organ function over time, over a lifetime, and an increase in life-threatening complications, including things like stroke, as well as over time, the development potentially of irreversible organ damage. And this can also be seen as a leading cause of death in adults with sickle cell disease. So who is affected by sickle cell disease? Well, uh, we approximate that a, at least 100,000 Americans are living with sickle cell disease. And as best as we know, uh, without having a formal uh, registry, is that the life expectancy for individuals born with sickle cell disease is sometime in their 40s. Now, sickle cell disease can be found among people from a variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds, lots of different countries across the world, but it disproportionately affects Black Americans in the United States. In fact, I think it's important for you to know that one out of every 12 Black Americans is a carrier of sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait is not sickle cell disease, it's a carrier state. Um, and someone who has sickle cell trait is at risk for having a child with sickle cell disease. And most individuals who have sickle cell trait in our country are completely unaware that they have it. Next slide, please. So how is sickle cell disease managed and treated? So this, is, this could be an entire hour's lecture, but what we wanna to convey to you that there are both best practices and the reality of the situation for people in our country living with sickle cell disease. So we know best practices, they've been published by individuals like Julie Cantor and colleagues. And we know that sickle cell disease or people who have sickle cell disease should ideally be treated and managed by specialized care teams, uh, which are composed of healthcare providers who both understand sickle cell disease and have experience treating it. That's the best practice. And there are concrete models of care that support this. But the reality in our country is that very few patients or individuals living with sickle cell disease actually receive the treatment that they need from these specialized teams. And most pediatric and adult healthcare providers in the United States do not have the knowledge, they do not have the experience, and they do not have the resources to care for individuals living with sickle cell disease. Next slide, and I'll give this back to Molly. Thank you, Bree. Um, I think what Bree has just framed up is, you know, there's so much that is going on, uh, especially for a patient living with sickle cell disease. I think one of the things that has been very clear as we look at, uh, it was the first genetic disease to be identified in the United States, uh, but what has happened in terms of real policy, meaningful change uh, that, that has happened for this patient population. Uh, the good news is that there is a significant momentum on the national and state levels as it relates to sickle cell disease. Unfortunately, not very much has happened when you compare uh, sickle cell disease to the other disease states, and I know we'll get to that in a couple of the other slides coming up. We are so proud of the NASM sickle cell disease blueprint that was published back in 2020. As much as you agree or disagree with the previous administration, there is some good that came out of uh, that administration uh, as it relates to sickle cell disease. Addressing the needs for patients living with sickle cell disease and that blueprint was a, uh, a really great um, uh, 
initiative that came out of the administration with former Assistant Secretary of Health, Admiral Girard. Uh, we were so delighted when that blueprint came out because it was a roadmap to help us better understand where we are today, but where we need to go tomorrow as it relates to policies. Uh, we're excited because uh, Bari and Betty have been amazing champions, especially at the state uh, level in really advancing policies really to bridge that gap in care for patients. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like, and I'm going to set this up uh, coming up in just the next slide, uh, where Bari is going to really talk about some of the efforts on the national level that we are pursuing as a community. I'll turn it over back to you, Bari. Thank you, Molly. Next slide, please. So we developed uh, about a year ago uh, the Council for Sickle Cell Disease Healthcare Equity, and this is a sort of a, a national think tank of experts that I'll, I'll show you all their pictures on the next slide and their names, but it really an effort to bring together a multi sort of disciplinary group of individuals, all committed to making a difference um, in chartering the course for individuals living with sickle cell disease in the US and beyond. And uh, when, this, when the uh, council was formed about a year ago, uh, we were guided um, by a purpose, uh, clear, clear guidance for what our goals were and uh, developed a vision for how we could improve the care of, of individuals living with sickle cell disease across the US. And so our purpose is to create a unified advocacy voice at the very highest level in order to bring into immediate existence, we don't wanna wait any longer, but immediate existence of broad programs that can impactfully improve the healthcare delivery toward all individuals living with sickle cell disease in the US. And in order to do this, we're guided by specific actionable objectives uh, that will be anchored in a broad vision of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine recommendations that Molly referred to in the previous slide. And we have two goals. First, to align with key stakeholders on the highest priority initiatives. And number two, to advance those priorities and bring them to fruition using collective strength of key stakeholders. And our vision is that in the United States, we would have a focused initial effort to create traction and precedent, but then have global expansion of, of our goals uh, using the momentum generated by the US effort. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the council members. Uh, you may know some or all of them, but I can assure you that all of these individuals eat, sleep, drink, pray, sickle cell disease and have for a very long time. And we include individuals who um, are healthcare providers and like Dr. Pace, renowned researchers trying to identify a better understanding for how sickle cell disease causes illness in individuals. We have prominent uh, and vocal advocates for sickle cell disease. And we have individuals living with sickle cell disease. So I feel, and parent, of someone with sickle cell disease. So we feel that the, the council very is sort of has broad understanding of the scope of what individuals with sickle cell disease across the age continuum uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, living with sickle cell. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll turn this over back to Molly, I believe, right? Yeah. Yes. So I think Bari just really framed up where have we been over the last year? This incredible community of stakeholders representing national groups, representing state groups, representing our local community. What did we come up with? What was the result of the work and the convening and the many, many discussions that we had over the last year? The outcome was we put together, as Bari just mentioned, uh, a framework that was really anchored around the NASM sickle cell disease blueprint, which we wanted to create an opportunity to really ensure that there were those transitions of care from pediatric to adult care. I think many of you that are on the webinar today fully understand that we have really, really good care in pediatrics. But once those patients transition to become adults, then we start to see the gaps in care there. We wanted to make sure that this was our first call to action is really to come up with a mechanism to really bridge that gap between pediatric and adult care. We are 
are so delighted to inform that we are going to be working with Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California and Congressman Mike Burgess from Texas in really advancing this care delivery model, which actually this is not new. This is something that has taken place in other communities. We're excited that this is actually going to happen for the sickle cell disease community because it is long long, long time coming. Uh, we are also very delighted that I think in partnership with our um, potential sponsors in the Senate, uh, we are going to be advancing a similar initiative, but we wanted to just make sure that you understood that we have uh, two sitting members of Congress that are very, very excited about this initiative because it really is going to be impactful in the community. Let's take it to the next slide so that you better understand what exactly is in the Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Center's Authorization Act. There are four key components of the Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Authorization Act, and let me go through them one by one. I, again, I encourage you to please put your comments or your questions in the chat so we can get to them, uh, because this is your opportunity to ask as many questions as possible. I know this is new, but perhaps the concept is not new. The hub and spoke model is not new to many of you, but would encourage you to really put your questions in the chat. One of the things that the, the stakeholders that Bree mentioned under her leadership came together, the national and state and local leaders, one of the things was we wanted to make sure that there was continuation of the HARSA sickle cell disease treatment demonstration. We wanted to make sure there is some really, really good work that started as a result of that HARSA demo. And we wanted to make sure that that continued. Uh, that is also embedded in the proposed language for the Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Center's Authorization Act. A second piece and a huge piece of, of this proposed language is the establishment of those transitions of care in one setting uh, underneath sickle cell disease treatment centers. So those hub and spoke models that we talk about all the time, this is new federal funding that would establish 128 new centers of excellence. And number two, would really fund community-based organizations as well. We are delighted that uh, we actually got consensus from all the stakeholders that we were working with to ensure that not only were we thinking about this from a national level, but we were also thinking about all the community-based organizations that continue to do such amazing work. The third element of the proposed language is really to identify a national regional coordinating center. We know there's already work that is underway in collection of data in a multiple of a different, different locations. We're not trying to recreate the wheel here. We're saying, is there an opportunity to make sure that that data is aggregated and a meaningful report is then presented to Congress every year? So we are getting a true litmus test on what is happening within sickle cell disease every single year. And the last piece of this proposed legislation is really improving and expanding that data collection and surveillance from the CDC, the Centers of Disease uh, Control. The, the, the best opportunity I think we've had to date is really seeing that uh, funding from CDC that's already in 12 states. They're already aggregating this data. They're collecting this data. They have a surveillance project that is underway. And we are just really excited to see this being incorporated as part of the proposed legislation. Again, these are the four elements of the legislation. I know there is a lot here, I think, to unpack, but we would be happy to work with you individually. Please feel free free to email any of us and, and ask us a, a lot more detail and color as it relates to this proposed legislation. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank Dr. you, Bates. Molly. Um, why do we need more federal funding? This is the key question that we have asked ourselves in the council. Um, the main reason for the funding would be to establish treatment and research for sickle cell disease because it's extremely limited now compared to other diseases. And we chose as an example hemophilia. When you look at the number of individuals who are affected with sickle cell disease, there's over 100,000, mainly African Americans. If you look at the number of individuals affected with hemophilia, which is a bleeding disorder, uh, it's about 33,000 and it affects mainly Caucasians. Let's look at the number of federally funded treatment centers, not the demonstration project, which is not a treatment center, but where actual treatment is rendered 
by a specialized team, there are no treatment centers for sickle cell disease in the United States compared to 130 for hemophilia, which have been operating for the last three decades, delivering primary specialized care to individuals with hemophilia. And if you look at the insurance coverage of our patient population, sickle cell patients on average are gonna be covered by Medicaid or Medicare compared to 32 to 38% of hemophilia. In some regions like in our state in Georgia, it can be as high as 90% who are covered by Medicaid and Medicare. So there is a need to provide treatment to these individuals. So if you look at FY21, the federal government provided about 9.2 million to sickle cell disease treatment and monitoring programs. And that was through the HRSA program and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. That is in contrast to for the Ryan White AIDS HIV program, which goes to help fund hemophilia patients, a $2.4 billion has been appropriated for that program. So we have a lot of disparity in funding and the council is really looking to step that up and make it more of a, a even spread between diseases like sickle cell disease and hemophilia. Next slide. So how did we come up with uh, our treatment centers and, and what was the strategy for that? So we feel like for the Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Centers Act of 2022, that if we have a need to fund about 128 sickle cell disease treatment centers based on a hub and spoke framework to treat, not to research, but to treat patients with sickle cell disease and other hemoglobinopathy or hemoglobin disorders. The centers will be distributed across the nation, but concentrated in regions of particular need. And if you take a moment and look at the map, you can see places like California, there's a large number of sickle cell patients. If you go across the South, Southwest, Texas has a large number, over 7,000. Then we get into the South, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, large concentration of sickle cell patients in the Carolinas. And then you go on up to the Northeast where we see New York with a large concentration in Philadelphia, Michigan, and uh, with Illinois in the Midwest. So based on where the patients are, we estimated at least one center is needed per thousand sickle cell patients. So we came up with 128 just to try to meet the need. And then in some regions where there's a small number of patients like in Idaho, et cetera, there still is a need to have access to care for those smaller number of patients who live in those regions. So the other component and, and the, the hub and spoke model would be composed of pediatric care, smooth transition to adult care, and then the adult program. So at each hub and spoke, at each center, those three components would have to be in place in order to be considered a sickle cell treatment center. And then the fourth component that is critical to the center would be a strong affiliation partnership with the community-based organization so that they can support patients, families, and communities to provide training and education to providers, patients, and families. And another critical part for the community organization would be genetic education for trait. We saw that one in 12 individuals, African-Americans are carriers of sickle trait so that translates into over 20 million people in the United States who have sickle cell trait and probably don't even know it. So we would have education for those individuals as well. And then the last component of this treatment center would be establishing these regional coordinating centers that will coordinate the infrastructure of these uh, treatment centers, monitoring and distribute data on how well they are doing, improving outcomes, working closely with the HRSA demonstration project and other initiatives for sickle cell disease, developing education campaigns, and then submitting an impact report to Congress to show what the outcome of the treatment centers are. So we're excited that we can finally put together a program where individuals with sickle cell disease will have full access to care and specialized care across the United States. Next slide. Molly, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. 
So the last time that we had legacy legislation was nearly 50 years ago, uh, when former President Nixon urged Congress uh, to really pass uh, something that would have meaningful impact, that would be purposeful and intentional for patients living with sickle cell disease. That was 50 years ago. And here we are 50 years later, almost at the same place, really urging Congress to pass monumental legislation that will create this transitions of care so patients are not falling through the cracks. So I think some of you know this legislative process. Sometimes uh, it's not very straightforward. Uh, it doesn't work sometimes as, as, as we think it should or the way it's been written on paper because there's just so much behind each and every step uh, that the federal budgeting and appropriations process takes. But we are urging you, um, I think as you sit in your positions, wherever you may be, this is an area where you can help. If you feel your organization uh, can help in this legislative effort, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the National Minority Quality Forum knows how to get in touch with myself and uh, Dr. Pace and Dr. Anna Mariam. So please feel free to reach out. This process has already begun. The clock is ticking. We are at the point between July and February from July last year to February this year during the process of the executive branch. This is where the executive branch takes a look at what has been spent, what is going on within each agency, and then determines what that budget process is gonna be. It then gets kicked over to the legislative process to our good colleagues over in Congress, in the House and the Senate. Um, I know we're a little late uh, with the executive branch process. We're hopeful, I think, as we see what the uh, president's budget is going to be uh, and what this if some of the agencies, including CDC, uh, is is going to be spending for their for their next um, uh, FY process. We're hopeful that some of these programs that are already in the way continue to, pro to progress. We know even programs within CDC, the one that I mentioned that is a component of the language that is proposed right now, it is not fully funded. It is not enough. This 11 states that the CDC is working on to collect data, it's not enough. We need to expand that program. I think as we get to July and October, we, we know Congress now will finalize the spending levels. So we don't have a lot of runway. The runway is short and we're urging you to raise your hand and help us with this legacy initiative. May I have the next slide, please? So I think as we wrap up our portion of the presentation, uh, how best can we keep you updated on this important legislative initiative? Uh, the National Minority Quality Forum will uh, add our respective contact information. Please let us know how you, we can keep you updated. And in addition to that, uh, you, the stakeholders that are out here, you are the key in getting this passed. You are the voices that Congress needs to hear from in really urging them to pass this legislation. Please let us know how you would like us to help in informing your respective organizations on this legacy initiative. I know we've got, I see several questions that have come through through the chat. So we are done with the formal part of the presentation and we're now gonna go into the Q&A. I'm going to start off already because we have several questions in the in the chat. Uh, very interesting question that came in regarding gene therapies. Um, gene editing is a promising cure for sickle cell disease. Dr. Pace and Dr. Anna Mariam, can you give an update on what is going on as it relates to gene therapies and editing? Well, I mean, I, I can start. I think so it's an exciting time. There's no doubt about it. I think it might be a little bit outside of the scope of this discussion, but um, so, you know, uh, gene therapy through gene editing, gene addition strategies really is an opportunity to um, potentially cure sickle cell disease. Um, traditionally, the cure for sickle cell disease um, has relied on bone marrow transplantation from somebody who matches the individual with sickle cell immunologically very well. So that's usually a full sibling, same mom, same dad. And we know that individuals uh, with sickle cell disease in this country are far far less likely than, than other individuals needing bone marrow transplants to have a, a sibling that matches them well enough. And a sibling that doesn't also have sickle cell disease who wouldn't be a suitable match. 
Um, so even though that's a known cure for sickle cell disease, um, and the first transplant in a young person with sickle cell disease took place in the early 80s, maybe 40 years ago, we still are not able to offer that um, universally to all individuals with sickle cell disease. So gene therapy uses bone marrow transplantation as the backbone of the treatment, but the individual is their own bone marrow donor. Uh, so, so theoretically, gene therapy could potentially be a potential curative option for all individuals with sickle cell disease. So, the, so just keep in mind, this is all still experimental. There are lots of clinical trials examining this, but to try to connect this to what we're talking about today, if you can envision a future where something like gene therapy or some other treatment, whether it's gene therapy based, whether it's a pill and infusion, whatever, um, is out there that could significantly change the course of the disease or even cure it, individuals with sickle cell disease aren't going to be able to get it if they don't have places to receive comprehensive care. So that's the fundamental thing that we're talking about today. How do we make sure that the tools that we have today to provide care with individuals with sickle cell disease of all ages and the tools that we envision for the future coming down the pipeline, how do we make sure that all Americans with sickle cell disease and eventually all individuals across the globe with sickle cell disease have access? They've got to have treatment centers of excellence. So that, that's my answer to that question. I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Pace. I, I think you answered it very well. And just a little bit about the gene editing. Uh, that is a very complex uh, technique that is being pursued. And it would allow us to hopefully one day give someone a treatment where their genes would be edited inside their body and then there would no longer be the need for a bone marrow transplant. So we're not there yet, maybe another couple of decades, but it's a very exciting time for gene therapy and gene editing. Wonderful, thank you both so much. Uh, we do have a question from Kennedy Jones. Kennedy asks, as a genetic counseling student, how do you think genetic counselors can be included into the interdisciplinary team for the hopeful treatment centers? I know Dr. Pace, we just had this conversation, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to sickle cell trait and really incorporating, I think those disciplines as part of the overall care for uh, some of these treatment centers. Would love to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about that. Yes, a wonderful question and thank you for asking. Um, genetic counselors are very rare. Uh, we don't have enough genetic counselors in the United States to be able to populate all of our treatment centers and, and I, that is my understanding of it. But we do definitely need genetic counselors to become a part, a more active part of the actual sickle cell disease program so that they can give the genetic education uh, that is needed for families and family counseling. So definitely we would want genetic counselors to be a part of the treatment centers and it would be wraparound services, not only genetic counseling, social services, uh, comprehensive care, you know, the dentist, ophthalmology. So we're talking about centers where all the care could be delivered and genetic counseling would be part of it. Now, when it comes to sickle cell trait, where we have the larger number, because we don't follow trait patients in the sickle cell centers, usually they're followed by the general pediatrician or the internist, but that's where a genetic education could then complement the genetic counselors through the community-based organizations where they could do the education related to sickle cell trait so that now we're providing some genetic form of education to both disease, to those affected with the disease and with sickle cell trait. So we definitely want our genetic counselors as part of the sickle cell centers. Great. We're going to go over to Maureen Beverly's question. The federal budget funding and legislative initiatives are extremely important. I couldn't agree more. Equally as important is a policy seeking to eliminate the word drug seeker as medical literature does not support the use of that word. How can that be incorporated as we continue to create awareness uh, on sickle cell disease? Anyone want to take that? That's an Great. excellent point. Thank you so much, doctor, for that question. Um, I think that with this proposed framework where you where, where we propose to strengthen the relationships between 
healthcare facilities where sickle cell expert care is delivered and community-based organizations where the community has the most trust in terms of information and has the most trust in terms of conveying how they feel about their care, that that's an opportunity to bring the two important stakeholders together to address issues such as this, which are deeply rooted in bias and racism and whatnot. Um, so I think that I, I think that's my answer to that question. Although I, I don't foresee an easy way to put something like that into legislation, um, I do think that combining the efforts of over 200 community-based organizations plus healthcare centers of excellence for sickle cell disease could address those types of major issues with a unified, powerful, and national voice. Excellent. Thank you, Marie. We have another question from, I hope I don't mess up your name, Oladipo Cole. Regarding CMS as it relates to reimbursement, um, Dr. Andamariam and Dr. Pace, can either of you comment on the efforts that potentially could be underway to really address that lack of provider reimbursement? Uh, and I'm going to add my own twist to this as well. Apologies, Oladipo Cole, I'm going to add to this. The <laughs> lack of providers, really, uh, to manage sickle cell disease. No, I, I can take a stab at it. Um... As you had stated earlier, Molly, for the most part in pediatrics, we have pretty good care delivery systems for individuals with sickle cell disease because for many, many years, it was considered a pediatric disease and we didn't have individuals living to adulthood at a significant number. But of course, the landscape has changed significantly. And now we expect individuals with sickle cell disease to live well into adulthood. But there is a lack of adult providers who have the expertise to take care of adult patients. So I'm hoping that these sickle cell uh, disease treatment centers would help to address that issue by providing more expertise in the adult uh, providers, where it becomes more of a, a generalized disease, a primary care type disease, so that we, have, we don't have to necessarily have it be hematologist, although that would be our preference, but someone who has learned the expertise to take care of adults with sickle cell uh, disease. So I think that the Medicaid, the whole issue about Medicaid and the number of our patients that are on Medicaid uh, in these centers, I'm hoping once we get them into these sickle cell centers and they get good care, the whole issue about drug seeking, maybe it would become less of an issue because they have some place to go to get their care and not trying to go to emergency rooms where people really tur get turned off by them. So I think that's important. And I'm sure Molly will have some comments about the Medicaid and the effort to uh, improve that because that is an important piece of this whole uh, council uh, activity that we're carrying out, Molly. Absolutely, we know that there is a significant Medicaid patient population uh, in in within our patients that we treat that we see uh, in sickle cell disease. So I think one of the areas that we're really being thoughtful of is ensuring that the system, uh, as we work with CMS, and I see we already have a comment from uh, the Centers of Medicaid and Medicaid Services. We would love to partner with you to see what could we be doing differently in really managing this patient population. So again, I think as Dr. Pace mentioned from that pediatric transitions of care from pediatric to adult care, most of the patients right now are seeking care in the emergency room. And we know that it's not usually a conducive place, really, especially if you're struggling with a chronic condition. So we look forward to partnership with CMS in really advancing, I think, this whole uh, uh, framework of the centers of excellence uh, under the sickle cell disease treatment centers. Let me go to a, another question that was asked by the audience. We don't have a name, uh, but what does the treatment landscape look like? Well, we may have uh, these treatment centers uh, and places of care that patients can go to, but what does the treatment landscape look like um, based on uh, what either of you have seen in terms of managing uh, managing patients? Is the question about like the current treatment landscape? Is that sort of just, fine? Yes. Yeah, so I think that's important. I think Dr. Pease touched on this a bit. So I'm an adult focused um, expert in sickle cell disease, uh, training in internal medicine and hematology. So I see 
the disparity in care for adults living with sickle cell disease every day. When I look at this in contrast with other um, conditions that affect adults, even rare conditions like hemophilia, you know, I'm the director of our hemophilia program as well. And they're great resources to develop and fund um, staff, uh, healthcare staff and social workers to take care of individuals living with diseases like hemophilia. But the landscape in sickle cell disease is quite different. And, and I think a lot of that is embedded in the fact that what Dr. Peace was saying, that this was considered for a very long time to be a disease that primarily affected children. So the, the adult-oriented medical professionals um, would say, well, we just, we haven't had much experience taking care of adults with sickle cell disease. We don't feel like we have the knowledge base or the experience to, to guide us. Um, but I don't think they get away with that anymore because for quite some time, you know, kids with sickle cell disease, like Dr. P said, are expected to make it to adulthood and thrive and live way beyond that. Um, but if you think about how, for example, an adult focused hematologist becomes a specialist in our country, well, they typically do a combined hematology oncology fellowship training. And I, you know, although I don't have the, the data and the statistics to support it, but having been here for nearly 20 years in this, in this field, I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of individuals that go into a hematology oncology fellowship that's adult oriented, do it because they're really interested in oncology primarily. So you've already gotten, so, so a substantial proportion of the individuals who should be experts in sickle cell disease simply just aren't interested in the hematology side of things, which is where sickle cell disease lives. And then if you look at those who are interested in hematology, the overwhelming majority of them are interested in other things like bleeding disorders, like hemophilia or clotting disorders or blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma and multiple myeloma. So there are very, very, very few doctors who go into the field of hematology oncology because they specifically want to take care of adults with sickle cell disease. So that's the, that's the landscape. The landscape is there's basically just maybe a few dozen at this point, adult uh, focused hematologists, oncologists around the country who specialize in sickle cell disease. And what that means is, as Dr. Pace was saying, is that, you know, the majority of adults with sickle cell disease in this country are not getting specialized care. And so, and because they're also getting, as, as Dr. Moverine mentioned, since they're often exposed to conditions of racism and bias when they do go to emergency rooms or maybe to primary care physicians or when they're hospitalized, um, they often try not to seek care, even if they're having an acute uh, issue, whether that's pain or fever or infection. Um, and so they, they are not getting quality care. And if they are, they're only going when they feel like it's something serious. But as I told you in the earlier slides, a lot of times um, what's happening to individuals with sickle cell disease is happening within the blood vessels. These, these blockages that are occurring and causing slow chronic organ damage over time are not felt. So they're not being screened for these potential complications or treated in a way to prevent them. So I hope that gives some understanding of kind of where we are now, which is we're not anywhere close to where we need to be. Fantastic. Um, let me turn it over, I think, to Dr. Pace. We have a question from Pat Corley. Uh, will the centers underneath this framework be freestanding specialty settings, mm -hmm. partnered and not integrated in the usual hematology system? We'll start with Dr. Pace and uh, Dr. Anna Merriam, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that. Very good. Actually, that's a good follow-up to the uh, landscape question. Um, and I just wanted to put a little bit of a caveat out there that it's, it's not perfect in pediatrics. I don't wanna leave the impression that everything is wonderful and hunky-dory in pediatrics and we don't need help in pediatrics. Um, put it in the context of newborn screening. Uh, there's a really a great need to have good follow-up for newborn screening, children who have been identified, children then having access to the specialty centers. Um, it, for instance, in where I am in Georgia, we have a lot of children who are in South Georgia who do not have the access. That's where the hub and spoke model would come in. 
so that we can provide access for those patients, even in pediatrics. And we were experiencing some of the same things where a lot of the pediatric hemoc doctors only want to do oncology versus the hematology. So we have some of the same challenges on the pediatric side. Um, so, the, so the question about, um, remind me again, Molly, the question- Will about, the centers, absolutely. Will yes. the centers be freestanding? Yes, so, so this is an important question. Mm -hmm. um, in pediatrics, almost all of our specialists, like myself and my colleagues, we're all pretty much associated with an academic center. So it's almost impossible to develop treatment centers without them being associated with academic centers in pediatrics. Now in adult medicine, you might be able to do that, but I think it would be challenging even in adult medicine. So we have to come up with some way to integrate these two entities, the pediatric hematologist who's associated with the academic center and these sickle cell disease treatment centers. We've never had this concept before of a treatment center. So there are comprehensive sickle cell programs in the United States already, but most of them are state funded programs. They're not federally funded. So I envision this as something where we can expand on now comprehensive centers that most of the time are underfunded, cannot provide all of the care that we can expand and make these sickle cell treatment centers. And I just don't see them being freestanding away from academic centers. I, I, possible in adult, but in pediatrics, I think they'll be connected to academic centers. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Anna Mariam, would you like to add anything yeah. to that? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I agree. Um, I agree with Dr. Pace. I, um, I also think that some individuals uh, on the um, council um, had had experience with sort of community, um, community based um, free, freestanding uh, units to be able to focus on treatment of individuals with sickle cell disease. And although those are those are not the, the bulk of the model across the U.S. for for adults, there are some there are some pockets where that does exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this in the in the language of the bill, oh, we were very careful to say that uh, various entities, including academic medical centers, community health centers, federally mm -hmm. qualified health centers, mm -hmm. could be eligible as long as they fulfill certain criteria of having an expert in sickle cell disease, having a care team, having an infusion center, um, having access to uh, the acute and chronic care needs of individuals with sickle cell disease, social work, psychology, mm -hmm. uh, telemedicine. Mm -hmm. So as long as these um, potential freestanding centers have all of the required elements, I think that the, the, they would be able to f fulfill the eligibility criteria and it would help us expand the current model of care, which we've already said isn't really working because not everyone, like Dr. P said, not everyone with sickle cell disease lives near an academic medical center. And that's not their fault. And so we have to sort of change the model to be able to allow for that access. That they may even partner with uh, the public health department. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in Georgia to provide care for those who are in South Georgia where they have less access. So there's a lot of different ways we can expand this model of care for sure. And just to make sure that everybody knows, I know there've been quite a few questions about whether uh, this webinar is being recorded. It is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the National Minority Quality Forum YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to the channel, you will receive an alert where the uh, videos are posted. So they will be made available. Let me just come back, uh, Dr. Anna Mariam and, and Dr. Pace, I think to something I think I'm picking up from the both of you. I think especially as we talk about the centers and the care and the delivery that is going to go into place. Place. We really can't talk about the care for patients if we're not talking about accessibility to treatments. Uh, do either of you have any comment in terms of some of the research that you've been doing? What is the treatment landscape look like? So I can start from pediatric perspective. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about standards of care and, and what things that we are doing for it. It's pretty well established now, the standards of care. I, I alluded to the newborn screening the standard of care is to get those children into the specialists as soon as possible, starting penicillin, you know, by the time they're three months old, uh, starting um, their, their normal uh, newborn shots, 
And then at two years of age, uh, starting screen for the transcranial Doppler for stroke. These are all standard of care now, and, and they need to come to a, a sickle cell treatment center in order to receive this because most pediatricians don't feel comfortable doing this. And the other big standard of care that we almost 100% take care of is offering hydroxyurea uh, as the main medication for preventing uh, pain episodes and for inducing fetal hemoglobin. And because it is a chemotherapy-like drug, most pediatricians don't feel comfortable uh, prescribing the drug. So we have to be able to do that as well. But we have very, very clear uh, outlined standards of care of things we're supposed to deliver to sickle cell patients, how often they come in for follow-up, for checking their blood counts, et cetera, so that we can put this into place in the treatment centers so that hopefully we'll do screening and, and catch, pick up on things early, yearly eye exam preventative measures so that we can avert some of these complications. So that's what we do on the pediatric side. And then of course, transition to adult care is really critical, making sure there's a strong transition program in. So, cause that's during the time where we see a lot of patients fall off, if the death rate increases during that transition time. So if we have both a pediatric and adult component and the community as part of the treatment center, then we can address standard of care, I think, in a more systematic way. Marie, your comments? I 100% agree. I mean, in, um, in adult sickle cell care, uh, we don't have as established approaches or as uniform approaches to care, although I think we're headed that way. One of the things that I think is, is important uh, for the audience to understand about optimal care delivery in sickle cell disease um, is the availability of uh, healthcare providers to be able to see patients on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So it, sickle cell disease is not the kind, it's not the kind of disease where you can just do a once a month or a once every three months or once a year follow-up because the nature of the disease is that there are these exacerbations of pain or the development of a fever or infection um, or the need, for example, for a transfusion because the blood counts get very low. Um, or the need to deliver certain medications in, um, in, in, in a healthcare provider's office. So uh, 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 the delivery of care for individuals with sickle cell disease requires a setting, a specialized center that's open every day with dedicated staff who are knowledgeable, right. nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, right. physician assistants to be there, not only for the routine needs and surveillance, but for the things that come up. So if I have a patient that wakes up in the morning with a severe sickle cell pain episode, they call our office and they get in the same day. They don't have to go to the emergency exactly. department. And if they don't go to the emergency department, my center and centers across the country have shown that they're far less likely to get admitted to the hospital for that pain episode if they can come to a sickle cell center and get that done. So that's a huge portion of standard of care that is only available um, in generally, usually in the academic medical centers or a few, or a few models of freestanding sickle cell centers, but just a handful in comparison to the number of individuals who need it. But these treatment centers with the hub and the spoke model will allow that for everyone. Mm -hmm. Finally. Exactly. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> I know we are almost coming up to time, but as the moderator, I'm gonna take the prerogative here and ask the final question. Uh, and then we'll come to either of you uh, with any final and closing remarks uh, before we close the program. Um, what do you think is going to be the greatest challenge in the implementation of the Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Center Authorization Act? Well, I think I'll try to take a crack at that. I think that um, I think that there's a little bit of sticker shock here, the price tag, which we've really not addressed, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I I've learned a lot from Molly in this process to understand that that's not a lot of money to ask from the government, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we are long overdue for it. And and we need these hundreds of millions of dollars in order to deliver the care the sickle cell population and community needs. So I think that's going to be the first hurdle is to convince even ourselves that this right. is not too much to ask for. It isn't. It's what we need. The rationale is there. 
And I believe if funded, it will not be difficult to get these sickle cell treatment centers and community-based organizations and data collection and surveillance and reauthorization of the treatment demonstration programs implemented or continued. I don't see that being difficult at all. There are plenty of individuals um, at, uh, who are experts in, in sickle cell disease, uh, as well as community-based organizations already doing the work who would be fantastic applicants um, for, for, this, for this money in order to do this work. That's not the issue. It's just getting this passed. That's what I'll say. I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I think for me, I think we're still going to have a challenge. If we're going to get, get 128 centers up and running, having enough docs, because in each center, remember, we want pediatrics and adults to have enough people who can actually be expert and run these centers. I think we're going to have to go outside of hematology to do this. We're going to have to train uh, family medicine doctors, internal medicine doctors, uh, pediatricians to have an interest in sickle cell disease and they become the experts so we can have these 128 centers across the country and the spokes. There are gonna to have to be a lot of spokes in order to make sure that there's access to care. So I, I think for me, just seeing how we, we're starting to struggle even in pediatrics with having enough physicians to care for them, we're gonna to have to have some type of strategy to de develop that infrastructure so that we have enough people to take care of because the patients are there. We just need the physicians to take care of them. So that'll be our challenge. Fantastic feedback and comments. And as we uh, close out the program, again, I just wanna really thank you too uh, for your stewardship, for your uh, incredible insights uh, in really putting together this framework to build this legacy initiative in sickle cell disease and create this hub and spoke model that the community has been talking about for a long time. Again, this is not new. It exists in other disease areas and we are long overdue as a sickle cell disease community to get our fair time and, and, and share uh, uh, of those dollars uh, from a federal perspective to really build this incredible care setting from pediatric to adult care that really gets patients um, uh, on their road and journey to wellness. Um, I would like to thank everybody for tuning in to this webinar. Thank you to our host, the National Minority Quality Forum. And uh, we thank you for your very, very active participation. As the team, the NMQF team mentioned, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I think our information was put in the chat. Please don't be shy. Feel free to reach out. Thank you all again and have a wonderful afternoon. Right. Well, yeah, thanks again, Molly, for leading the conversation. I'm just going to put it out there, your email address, if folks want to uh, get in touch with you. I'm just making sure it's right. It's mryan at gsk, excuse me, at gbt. I'll then let it, mryan at gbt.com. That's correct, right? That is correct, Brandon. All right. So if you have any questions or concerns, yeah, please contact Molly. She's obviously great at this and knows this space. Um, and again, thank you for just this, everybody in the audience for this robust conversation. It's just great reading all the comments and all the questions. Um, Keiko, thanks for putting this together as usual. And Docs, we really appreciate your expertise and we hope to hear from you soon. And we love working with you at the NM NMQF. With that, we'll see everyone next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.